right? I'm a, I'm a gamer, so I need the microphone to be in frame. <laughs> One D&D now has a bard, ranger, and rogue, making One D&D significantly more possible to actually playtest as a game. <laughs> and so we're going to look at each of these redesigned classes and some more of these foundational game mechanics that have been added to the rules glossary. And we'll look at a few of the most popular feats, but all as a quick overview of what features and updates are really fun and thematic because I'm Bob, this is where we learn how to have more fun playing D&D together, and these are the expert classes. As it says right here, this document is the second in a series of Unearthed Arcana articles that present material for the next player's handbook. So that first survey just ended. Of course, they haven't had time to go through the 40,000 plus responses yet and make a new version of that, but this one does contain some core rules, like new way that they're handling crits, or really I should just say, 2014 player's handbook way that they're handling crits. Inspiration has switched from getting it on a 20 to a one. And I love that experimental approach. Now check this out. It does say the character options you might read here could be more or less powerful than the options in the 2014 player's handbook. I think on the whole, these are all a little bit more powerful. I don't think there's huge buffs or Definitely not any huge nerfs. Like I already saw some people reacting like, oh my gosh, what happened to the rogue? But what I am really excited about is they've teased some stuff right here. So we're getting revised versions of every class from the 2014 player's handbook. But one interesting fact about that is it implies we are not getting an artificer in the new player's handbook in 2024. 48 subclasses, again, if we stick to our current 12, that would mean there's an even four for each. So I look at that as a little more evidence that, that they're not including Artificer. New spells, feats, of course. New weapon options for certain classes. No idea what that means, but it's very exciting to me who is currently working on a 5e weapon system project. New rules for creating a home base. New revised encounter building rules, which is great because we all know CR is kind of doesn't work that well. <laughs> and new and revised monsters. So we probably will be getting monsters with more of these recharge mechanics that were promised. And another really interesting thing here is how we have classes now grouped into these four main categories. Experts is the first one, which is truly just the miscellaneous category because obviously like a wizard is an expert in what they do. But overall, this is a great thing organizationally for new players, because rather than being like, hey, here's 12 classes you can play, now you just get to say, all right, do you wanna be this highly specialized expert type character? And we're gonna take a quick look at each of these, not spending a lot of time, because Crawford even said in an interview that while everything in here has been tweaked, the vast majority of the tweaks are small. So we're not gonna like dig deep and do a you know, A and B comparison of everything from the PHB to everything here. That is that is just not my style. Can't dwell on the past. Let's be excited about what we got. Let's go. The first thing that I saw when I looked at this table is that bards now have prepared spells. They always used to have known spells where they would just pick a couple and that's what you get. Bardic inspiration die now featured right here. And yeah, really keen-eyed people who know the exact order that bards used to get everything will see that there are some shifts in this but by and large, everything is pretty much the same for bards. Ranger gets the most changes out of the three. We'll just say that out of the gate. We have our step-by-step -step hit points, proficiencies, basically just telling you to go through these things in order. But it, I'll scroll down for a sec. It's interesting how in each one of these, they have a section for multi-classing, just built right into the class because it has become very clear that 1D&D &D is so much about options and customization. But what they do, it seems, is tell you about how to be the bardiest bard skills you can have deception performance persuasion or any three skills of your choice but it tells you off the bat that those three are really good ones to start with it just gives you equipment right here and it says or you can spend 100 gold pieces on equipment of your choice and we're going to see this for our prepared spells at first level it recommends taking the prestidigitation and vicious mockery cantrip this is excellent for new players and frankly excellent even for experienced players who have just never played that class before now i'll just add one thing i was pleasantly surprised to see is that they're still recommending uh, hit points per level after first that you roll your dice i think it's cool to just take average but i was impressed that they still lean toward the randomization of hit points rather than guaranteeing more health, which is also a theme uh, with some bard stuff we're going to see here. So right in the main feature, 
bardic inspiration, like this is what this is the a defining feature of all bards. You can boost a d20 test, but check this out for another creature in 60 feet that can see or hear you. I think it always used to be just see or just hear, but now it's both, so that's neat. And it triggers when they fail a d20 test. So when they fail that check, that save, that attack roll, now you can use your reaction to give the bardic inspiration die. And now one thing very similar that I don't love necessarily is this healing feature. Again, as long as the creature can see or hear you, if they take damage as a reaction, you can use your bardic inspiration die to heal them. That's pretty wild. That means as soon as a character goes down that you can hear or see, bang, they're back up instantly. And I don't know if I love it because that should be a cleric's job to me. But I think it's really cool that it exists and that it diversifies what you can do with Bardic Inspiration. Like it's a guaranteed really helpful thing. And it's worth noting here, looking at spellcasting, that bards start with arcane magic and particularly the schools of divination, enchantment, illusion, or transmutation. Point is, later on, they can choose from all three spell lists. Of course, they get expertise. And I should have mentioned before that expertise is the defining feature for this expert category. So rangers are gonna get expertise, rogues get expertise as well. You know, their song of rest has been changed to, instead of just like adding a D6 or something it used to do, now you get to choose from spells. I really like that. And it's just one that you always have prepared. Jack of all trades, font of inspiration. A lot of these things are very similar and worth pointing out here. Yes, at 20th level, we get an epic boon. This was a DMG thing that is now moving into the player's handbook. It's a little cool, but personally, I don't think, yeah, I've never played at level 20. <laughs> not once, not even like a one shot. And I think most, like the vast majority of D&D players have not. Maybe this will get more people interested in it. And in this doc, we have the updated College of Lore. So again, we're gonna see at least three more Bard subclasses at some point in UA, but this is what they're including here is like the main one to make it playable and play testable. And to me, a lot of this looked the same. Cutting words, cunning inspiration, is that the same? I don't know. And now before we really dive into the ranger, one thing that 1D&D &D does not have, yet anyway, is a fun and simple rule set for your heroes to harvest loot from monsters and then craft that loot into useful items and weapons. So I highly recommend Monster Loot from our sponsor, the Dungeon Masters Guild. Volume one contains easy mechanics and loot for every monster in the monster manual. Just kill the young white dragon of Icepire Peak, roll your nature check, and maybe you'll get 1d2 white dragon fangs that can be crafted into short swords that deal an additional 1d6 cold damage. Use code one Bob to save 10 percent on PDF purchases of $10 or more from the DMs Guild through October 7th, 2022. Okay, ranger time. <laughs> ranger, ranger time? <laughs> time to check out our ranger. They've really done us pretty well here. Dexterity, wisdom, these are our primary abilities. Should have pointed that out for the bard as well. They tell you right up front, most of your bonuses are derived from these abilities. Prepared spells, that's new for the ranger. They used to have known spells and they get spell casting at first level. Our starting equipment, very rangery. Uh, you'll notice short sword is underlined here because short sword has been changed from a martial weapon to a simple weapon now. And that was really cool to see because I had already done like independently had already done the same thing in the 5e weapon project that I'm working on. I'm thinking like the designers now with, or I don't know, ho hopefully in the good ways. <laughs> they get expertise at first level. So that's new immediately. Like, some of their skills are going up and favored enemy. Woo. Big change here. You're not just like choosing a creature type anymore. Now you just have Hunter's Mark all the time. Like, let me emphasize that this is all a cool thing. You always have Hunter's Mark repaired. You don't have to concentrate when you cast it. Now I can just narrow, I can just hone in on my quarry during combat. It's cool. Guidance is underlined because they did change that to be a little less like spammable. Fighting style is a feat now. Check that out. You gain one of the following fighting style feats of your choice at second level still. Later on, whenever you can choose a feat, like any time you have the opportunity to get a feat, you can choose another fighting style instead. That's pretty cool. Oh, and I'll say this as well. Ability score improvement versus feat is not exactly like a choice anymore because now they've just made ability score improvement into a feat, but all of the fourth level feats also include at least a plus one to an ability score. And then like roving at level seven, this is pretty cool. Plus 10 to your speed. You also have a climb and swim speed equal to your speed. So at level seven, all of a sudden rangers are 
<laughs> extremely mobile. Tireless at level 11, this is really cool. Whenever you finish a short or long rest, you can just give yourself 1d8 temporary hit points. And, oh man, exhaustion changed a lot. We'll check that out later. But at level 13, you can just like be invisible. You invoke the spirits of nature to magically hide yourself from view. As a bonus action, you can expend a spell slot and become invisible till the end of your next turn. So this seems pretty powerful to me. Uh, it would be cool to see a less powerful version of this earlier on instead of getting all the cool stuff here at the end. Like some blind sight at 15th level, Hunter's Mark dealing extra damage at 18th, and of course our epic stuff coming in. But our subclass included here is the Hunter. You just get an extra D8 damage when you're fighting any target that is missing any of its hit points. And the sixth level feature is actually pretty great for the Hunter. You just know on any target that you have Hunters marked, their immunities, resistances, and vulnerabilities in your head as if you've studied this creature before, or it's that primal magic, just like giving you this knowledge about your prey. Very nice. And something they have kind of like tucked into this, but you can now downcast spells, which is something that I brought up like two years ago in one of, I don't know, a very early video I made about spell casting as like a potential cool homebrew thing. So I'm tuned in, man. <laughs> and the rogue. Again, I don't think they changed a lot with the rogue. I know Crawford even said in one of the interviews with Kenrick, like, hey, when we polled people a while back, Rogue had by far the highest satisfaction ratings of any class and like every feature was like highly beloved So they really didn't change very much here at all. One small thing is that sneak attack or <laughs> They didn't change sneak attack. <laughs> One small thing is that thieves can't sorry Now just gives you another free language could be standard or rare. All right 13th level I'm pretty sure this is new or at least changed or renamed subtle strike when you attack, you know how to exploit a target's distraction. You have advantage on any attack roll that targets a creature that is within five feet of at least one of your allies who isn't incapacitated. I think at this level they got a little bit of blindsight before, which was kind of a lot. So I think it's like some people are considering that a net loss. Again, it's like no one gets to 13th level anyway. It's fine. <laughs> but check out this thief subclass. Uh, at third level, you get fast hands. And look at this. Search. You can take the search action. That's a new action added to the game. And this seemed, this seemed new to me. Again, maybe I just haven't looked at the PHP thief subclass in long enough, but Supreme Sneak, you just have advantage on every stealth check you make at six level, provided you aren't wearing medium or heavy armor. That, that seems like a lot, but uh, sounds fun. And feats. We're just gonna look at a few of the real popular ones here. Crossbow Expert. Uh, this is one people like, right? Firing in melee. Being within five feet doesn't impose disadvantage. If that wasn't a thing, that's really helpful. When you make the extra attack of the light weapon property, you can add the ability modifier. Okay, looks like it's very geared toward uh, hand crossbows. That's probably like a very well-known build that I just <laughs> don't know about. And great weapon master. This is one people love, right? Uh, <laughs> and when you hit a creature with a heavy weapon as part of the attack action on your turn, you can cause the weapon to deal extra damage to the target equal to your proficiency bonus. And you can only deal it once per turn. Yeah, I think Great Weapon Master is the one that used to be like, you take minus five to your attack roll and you get plus 10 on the hit. Build brain, people. Tell me in the comments if this is, if this is a, a nerf. All right, but let's get to the good stuff. The rules glossary. <laughs> it, it really doesn't sound very exciting, but it is, trust me. So armor training, this is just a little rename for armor proficiency because they realized, hey, armor proficiency doesn't actually have anything to do with your proficiency bonus, so we should call it something different. And now they do. Ah, exhausted condition. While you are subjected to the exhausted condition, known in older books as exhaustion, you experience the following effects. Levels of exhaustion. This condition is cumulative. Each time you receive it, you gain one level of exhaustion. You die if your exhaustion level exceeds 10. When you make a d20 test, you subtract your exhaustion level from the d20 roll. Super simplified, you're no longer gonna have to be like jumping to the exhaustion table every time it's triggered. No one ever memorized how that worked. And finishing a long rest removes one level from your exhaustion. And this is cool because what it does is it really enforces the idea of taking a few days of rest in a town, in your home base that they're gonna help us build. And inspiration change, yeah, you earn it on a one now instead of a 20. I mean, again, it's not like 
now this is it forever. It's like, this is just another version and they want to see how we respond to it. Personally, I think the 20 and the one are both like perfectly valid times to get inspiration. And I can, I can happily say I've actually play tested getting it on the 20 now and it worked really well. Also, I play tested not getting crits as a DM and it did save the butts of my level one characters. <laughs> and here is a really fun one, the light weapon property. They've just removed the need to have that extra attack be a bonus action. So now you can make two attacks with two light weapons, one in each hand, just as a single attack. That's great. And here's what I was saying about search. It just kind of like tells you what skill to use. The influence action. You can try to influence another creature to do something you request or demand. This action can only be used on creatures controlled by the DM, so you can't use it PvP. And it isn't mind control. I love how it just lays that out. It can't force a creature to do something that is counter to the creature's alignment or otherwise repugnant to the creature. So, sorry, bards. You know what I'm talking about. Nah, but try to find the time to playtest this stuff, take the survey. Thank you, and keep building.